Hello everyone and welcome back to the Belgian Beer Brothers channel. I am Cedric and today we are tasting the second to last Geurs or Old Geurs from the Tour de Geurs home box. Um, I know that I told you guys I would uh, finish this series off last week but unfortunately I have fallen ill so yeah sorry for the wait you guys but I am all better uh, sort of <coughs> and we will finish this job today and tomorrow and a uh, second to last we have a, a very special brewery on the menu and I know that I've said that for about five or six times out of these nine uh, but what's special uh, about this brewery is that they are found to be the oldest lambic brewery in the world and of course they love uh, showing off with that because it's even in their slogan um, but today we're talking about brewery Timmermans you might know uh, brewery Timmermans from their collaborations with Guinness and there's a reason for that and uh, we're gonna talk about that later on but first off um, originally brewery Timmermans was thought to be founded in 1781 and somewhere around 2010 some uh, documents were found and apparently a brewery already existed in their location called the Molleke or the Mole and if you google it you can find uh, some logos from brewery Timmermans with a wooden barrel and a mole standing on top of it and on the label of the barrel it says 1702 so yes uh, in 1702 a brewery was present uh, apparently it was owned by Jan van der Meulen and Joanna Esselings and it wasn't just a brewery it was uh, yeah it wasn't that special back in the days but it was a farm with a brewery but this was a very extensive uh, location because it was written as a farm with a brewery some sheds uh, stables an orchard and even a hop attic and a hop ast as we say in, uh, in Flemish a hop drying rig um, there is some talk about it having a malt tree as well but the malt tree was uh, built way 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 later so the family that originally was taught to have founded the Timmermans brewery or the original Timmermans brewery um, family Verheilewege was already present here as well because in 1690 Peter Verheilewege and there's some discussion about the name being Van Heilewege or Verheilewege but it uh, appears to be Verheilewege he was born in 1690 and several years later of course uh, he had a son called Hendrik and they they bought the estate and Hendrik used to run a still on the estate for a few years and only later on uh, they started brewing there so technically the new brewery was founded in 1781 after all previous brewing activities had been long gone then in 1814 uh, the brewery got leased to an old innkeeper called Jacobus Walravus and remember the name Walravus um, because there used to be a Walravus brewery as well and uh, Jacobus Walravus only brewed about four brews a year these were 15 hectoliter brews uh, so he brewed about 6,000 liters a year and apparently that was just to provide for the relay station um, back in those days this location used to be a relay station um, where a lot of uh, coaches passed by and there probably would have been uh, a blacksmith or something of that kind um, a bit later on Hendrik dies and he leaves everything to his wife uh, Anna Katharina 
and his son Guillaume. But in the meantime, the brewery is still rented to the family Wallerhavers. In 1830, it gets, or ownership at least, gets passed down to Guilhelmus de Donker and Maria Theresia Lindemans. Now again, uh, it's a family business, but the Donker Brewery and Lindemans Brewery, of which we're going to talk tomorrow, are very well-known names in the brewing world, or at least in the local brewing world. If we look at the numbers, in 1934, Production was already increased to more than tenfold what Paul used to brew. So in 1934 they already brewed about 700 hectoliters a year, as opposed to the 60 hectoliters that Jacobus used to brew. In 1965 the brewery gets passed down again, or at least the estate gets passed down again to Joanna de Donker and Eugenius Gustavius or Eugene van der Putten. Even later, in 1898, the brewery finally gets sold to Paulus or Paul Wallerhavers, son of Jacobus, sorry, grandson of Jacobus. But by 1998, or oh sorry, 1898, the Wallerhavers family had already leased the brewery for almost a hundred years, so they finally got the chance to buy the brewery. So Paul and his wife Albertina de Smet, also of a brewing family, buy the estate and Paul decides to rebuild the brewery and expand it with a maltry. So like I said, it was way, way, way later. The brewery that he built back then is more or less the current brewery that's still there. At least it got repurposed, but it is still there. Then in 1911, Paul's, uh, Paul and Albertina's youngest daughter, Selina, marries a young bloke called, uh, and bear with me, Gerardus Franciscus Timmermans, or nicknamed Franz Timmermans. And Franz was a brewer's son from Zun, a very small town, in St. Peter's Leeuw, about three miles south of where they were in Iterbeek. Immediately in 1911, the couple takes over the brewery, or at least Franz buys out his father-in-law, because his family already owned a brewery. And right after that, they discontinue the farm as well as the orchard in order to fully focus on the brewery and even expand the brewery uh, and the bar and the malt tree. Then in 1922, 11 years later, the relay station got demolished and that meant more space for the brewery to expand again, which they did. Then in 1929, France becomes uh, mayor of Iterbeek, another brewer that becomes mayor of his town. I see a pattern here and we will hear about, yeah, we will hear that later on with some other brewers uh, and even more often. So he becomes mayor of uh, Iterbeek and he stays on until 1955, so a 26 year reign. And he is set to govern from the brewery rather than from town hall. Uh, Apparently he was never present at Town Hall and he, yeah, he liked the brewery more. It was his home. Now, because he had his hands full with being mayor and all, in 1930, so one year after uh, he became mayor, his son-in-law, Paul van Kutsum, follows him up in the brewery and he decides uh, not only to invest a bit, but also to change the name to Brewery Timmermans instead of at Molleke. Then later on in the 1950s, um, Paul modernizes the brew house and he puts in two new kettles, two, um, yeah, how can I call this? Two um, field kettles, um, or kettles rather uh, heated by fuel burners instead of a wood fire. 
and a new uh, filter ton. Of course, with this, he uh, he also expanded the brewing capacity. Of course, there's a bit of discussion about this uh, because this means that the artisanal brewing practices got industrialized a, a bit. But well, Google the pictures and you will see that for all intents and purposes, uh, for compared to breweries that we know these days, that was still an artisanal brewery. It just got sped up a bit and, and in larger capacities. A bit later on, in 1959, uh, Paul's sons, Raoul and Jacques van Kutzen, take over the brewery. And in 1960, they go public. In 1984, 24 years, years later, Rizla, and the older people among you will still know that name, but Rizla is the uh, the producer of the cigarette rolling papers. Rizla buys a share because, of course, they noticed that the Timmermans Brewery is expanding and making good money, and they wanted a piece of that cake. Then, in 1989. Uh, a new state-of-the-art bottling line is built because of course they went public they picked up a lot of money and they built a state-of-the-art a large bottling line then a few years later in 1993 John Martin group which already uh, divides Guinness and everything takes over the Rizla share Consequently, uh, this was the biggest share, making John Martin basically owner of the Timmermans Brewery, but only of the company Timmermans, not the buildings, not the grounds. Of course, for John Martin, this was a, a huge step because John Martin already produced a lot of other beers and with the acquisition of Timmermans, they had a brand new state-of-the-art bottling line so they could upscale their production and send a lot of beer to Timmermans to get bottled which they did in 2006 the Timmermans brewery hit uh, an absolute milestone because they produced 15,000 hectoliters of lambic uh, in one year making them the biggest lambic brewery in the world at the time so they weren't only the oldest but they didn't know that back then they were also the biggest then in 2009 a beer museum is erected on the site think back to the old kettles and everything and in 2012 the site is archived as heritage including the old installation and the family home then in 2018, uh, Anthony Martin, because in the meantime, Anthony had taken over from his father, John Martin, but Anthony Martin finally gets the chance to buy the buildings of the Timmermans uh, family. So finally, they owned the entire brewery, including the buildings and the grounds and the museum and everything. Technically, Timmermans is a part of the uh, Anthony Martin's finest beer selection, but they have a separate status within the company uh, because they are the only Geus or Lambic brewery. They are, they have a special story on its own, but they still bottle a lot of the Tim, uh, a lot of the Anthony Martin's beers. Now, coincidentally, this month Anthony Martin started brewing here in Antwerp again. That is to say, the Antwerp Brewing Company expanded earlier this year. They almost tripled their capacity. And Anthony Martin had a lifelong dream of uh, brewing in Antwerp again. So, one on one makes two. ABC has the capacity. Anthony Martin has the dream. They talk to each other. And here they go. So, now they will be brewing in Antwerp again, but still sending their beer to Timmermans for bottling. Another nice detail is 
Um, Timmermans holds on to traditions. For example, they have a, a fantastic brewmaster called Willem van Herrewegen. And some of you might know the name Willem van Herrewegen um, because he used to work at Diepenstein at Palm Brewery, now owned by Heineken. But his legacy goes uh, further than that, even in the, the world of Geurs and Lambic, because he's also one of the founders of brewery De Cam. Or I say brewery, it's actually a blendery, but blendery De Cam. And De Cam already bought Lambic from, I believe, Bonn and Timmermans. And Willem went to Timmermans and became brewmaster, brewing engineer. Their current production got upscaled to a whopping 23,000 hectoliters a year. So they even upped their game from 2006 with 50%. With and about three quarters of that is used for the production of other beers. And by that I mean uh, the Lambic is used to make Oude Geus, Timmermans, but also, uh, for example, Bourgogne de Flandre, uh, the red ale or red sour ale from Bruges. And the list goes on and on. Now, I do believe that um, this won't be the last we've heard from Timmermans. They already do their collaboration with Guinness. They export, uh, I think, about 60% or 40% of their production. It is a great brewery, but of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So let us taste the Audigeurs. And I must admit that I have never tasted a Timmermans Audigeurs. I am very familiar with their other beers, or at least with Martin's other beers, like the Martin's Pale Ale, or Guinness, or Antwerpen Stout. Here we have the logo I talked about with a tiny mole on the barrel. Hmm. 1702. On the muselette. Yet again, a nice 37 and a half centiliter champagne bottle. If you Google Timmermans Audigeus, you will often find that it is a 5.5% ABV beer, but it is in fact a 6.7. Not too much pressure on there. Ooh. A lovely tender smell. And even on the cork, it has the logo with the mole on the tongue or on the barrel with Timmermans 1702. Lovely cork. As I said before, I love printed corks. I am keeping those. <coughs> and this Audigeus is of course, um, as usual, a blend of one, two and three year old Lambics. Uh, this one is said to be brewed, according to the neck label, in 2018 and bottled in 2021. So it's, um, yeah, the blend of the three years, bottled in 21, uh, yeah, bottled in 21, and then matured on the bottle for another six months. Yeah, lovely tender smell, even a bit sweet, a bit sugary, although it's not faro, there's no sugar being added to this. Already a lovely color. It's more like a golden yellow, not much orange in there. Some rather large bubbles in the foam. A white or off-white head. And the beer is quite active. I see a lot of bubbles in there. Of course, in this white uh, glass, this white top glass, the aromas are set free. And the scent is now a bit more sour, a lot less sweet, but still very tender. 
a bit of hay. I don't want to see. I don't want to say stable or horse, but at least a bit of fresh hay in there. Slightly herbal. A bit woody. So I'm actually excited to taste this. Ooh, that tastes a lot more sour than it smells. Yeah, it is a, a very dry, very sour beer, but it's not sharp. It's like, it has a very well-rounded taste. Rather fruity, not so much lemony, I'd say a bit of grapefruit, some very very fresh sour green apples and a hint of vinegar. Yeah, definitely a hint of vinegar. Wow. I can tell you, you don't have to brush your teeth after this one. You might even have to go look for the enamel on your teeth. Okay, also the aftertaste is rather bitter dry, more hoppy actually, not what I expect from a Gus. But in conclusion, I can tell you that um, if you're not used to Gus and if you don't know yet if you like it, don't start with this one. Now we have seen some in the past two weeks that are absolute great beginner gurses or, or gateway gurses. Um, yeah, let's say that this is pretty much an intermediate one. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna take my time to enjoy this well. And I will see you guys again tomorrow for the very last one in this box. And that is the Lindemans Audigeus Cuvée René, which has a story all on its own. And I can already uh, tell you guys that next week, because I'm going on a holiday this week, uh, next week we will be unboxing a rather special crate from Lindemans as well. So we're staying with Lindemans for another week. But first tomorrow, the Audigeus. As usual, if you like this, comment, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon if you want to get notified about new videos or if you're just curious for the Lindemans crate. And yeah, I'll see you guys again in the next videos. Cheers, you guys.